ACM Houston's virtual programs. Thank you for taking time out and being here this evening. I'm Tamara Savage, Managing Director and Director of Public Programs, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gregory Maddox as our guest speaker for our live webcast. We are fortunate to have the traveling exhibit Mandela Struggle for Freedom on view at our museum until January the 3rd of next year. And if you live in the Houston area, we encourage you to visit our museum and go through this very excellent exhibit. We will leave time for a brief Q&A at the conclusion of Dr. Maddox's talk. To participate, please submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will open the Q&A box for questions towards the end of his talk, and we'll do our best to get as many of the questions as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Maddox, who will discuss the topic, the anti-apartheid movement in Houston, supporting liberation in South Africa and cultivating activism at home. Gregory Maddox is a specialist in African and environmental history. He holds a BA from the University of Virginia, and a PhD from Northwestern University. In addition to teaching at Texas Southern for 30 years, he spent a year <clears throat> at the University of Dar es Salaam in, Tan in Tanzania as a Fulbright senior lecturer. He has published articles in several journals and edited collections. He has, edited, he has co edited two collections with James Gilbin of the University of Iowa Custodians of the Land, Environment, and History in Tanzania and In Search of the Nation, Histories and Authority of, and Dissidents from Tanzania. In addition, he has written numerous scho scholarly books on Tanzania and Sub-Saharan Africa. He is currently Dean of the Graduate School and Director of International Programs at Texas Southern. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Maddox. Thank you so much, Mara. It is such a pleasure to speak with the Holocaust Museum Houston uh, and to be a part of this wonderful exhibit that they have brought to our city. Um, the exhibit and the, the catalog that comes with it are, you know, are a good introduction into the political struggles that, that went on in South Africa over, the, over apartheid and the struggle to end racial domination in South Africa. What I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight is the anti-apartheid movement in support of the liberation struggle in Southern Africa, uh, both here in the United States, but particularly here in Houston, because Houston, as it turns out, was a particularly active spot for anti-apartheid uh, activities over the course of the 1980s. I'm hoping that will be joined by at least one or two of the veterans of that struggle and they can uh, correct me when I make a mistake on this, on, on anything. Um, but to get started, I'm, I'm going to assume that most people have at least a brief, you know, bird's eye view of Southern African history. Uh, the, the region, uh, of course, long settled by the African populations that, lived, that had lived there for, for millennia was uh, was first uh, penetrated by Europeans in the 1600s when the Dutch founded a colony at Cape Town uh, on the very tip of the, of the African continent. In many ways, the history of, of European settlement in South Africa, and unlike much of the rest of Africa, mirrors that of other settler, settler colonies across the globe that were founded in about the same time, most notably the United States. Um, you know, there were numerous uh, different elements of the European population that came to South Africa, dominated by the Dutch in the 17th and 18th centuries, followed by British conquest in the early 19th century and gradual expansion of British settlement in the area, struggle between the descendants of Dutch settlers and British uh, imperial uh, forces in, that broke out in the late 19th century and resulted in the creation of what was first called the Union of South Africa uh, that in essence took its place uh, rather like Canada or Australia and the British Empire as a self-governing dominion. Uh, within South Africa itself, uh, throughout the first decades of the 20th century, one of the great issues that sort of motivated uh, that drove history in that time was the struggle over how the majority of the population of the region, which was African, 
was going to relate to the emerging political structures that were created out of this uh, synthesis of colonialism and settlement. Uh, for much of the early 20th century, at least some Blacks in South Africa had things such as the right to vote, certainly the right to, to own property, uh, and, and numerous other uh, sort of a, elements of citizenship. However, within South Africa itself, within the white population, and especially amongst the Afrikaner, the descendants of the, of the Dutch, uh, original settlers, there was a strong movement that, that focused on white supremacy, that focused on white control, uh, and that gave and that gained its fullest expression after World War II in the development of the idea of apartheid, apartness, uh, which basically sought to separate African populations from the white dominated regions in South Africa, except to the extent that African labor was needed in the mines and the cities and in the factories that South Africa developed over the course of the 20th century. Now, against this, uh, African liberation, in fact, actually, the oldest African liberation movement in Africa is comes from South Africa. The African National Congress was founded in the early 20th century as an organization dedicated to promoting the rights of Black South Africans uh, in you know, this emerging sort of uh, white dominated society. Uh, by the, after, the, after the implementation of apartheid, the ANC moved in a more radical direction given uh, the, the loss of any sort of leverage within the political structures that, uh, that existed in white South Africa. And a new generation of leadership emerged led by men like Nelson Mandela. During the 1950s, as much of the rest of Africa prepared to become independent from colonial rule, uh, the ANC moved towards more direct action to contest white domination. Mandela emerged as the, the dominant leader. And as the as 1960, uh, broke and African liberation began to occur across the continent, um, Mandela led the ANC into uh, what they termed armed conflict. Uh, Mandela himself, after a couple of years in exile, building uh, support for this, for this idea, uh, creating an organization both inside and outside South Africa to, to support black liberation. Um, came back to South Africa, was arrested a, at a farm in Rivonia, and in 1962 was convicted to uh, basically lifetime in prison, imprisonment in, in South Africa. Now I'm going to share my screen, so give me just a second. Mandela was imprisoned at Robben Island. And from there, uh, he, although isolated in many ways from uh, the movement, uh, he also exerted a sort of uh, an influence in absence that, that pro provided a strong symbol for the continuing oppression of, of black people in South Africa. Over the course of the 1960s, uh, as much of the as the rest of the African continent became independent, as struggles against the uh, continued white domination in in Rhodesia, southern Rhodesia, which eventually is going to become independent as Zimbabwe, and the Portuguese colonies, particularly of Mozambique and Angola, uh, Mandela became the became this international symbol of the struggle for black liberation in South Africa. These are pictures from Robben Island from a trip that we at Texas Southern took with students in 1912. I mean, I'm sorry, 2012, obviously. <laughs> um, this is the view of Cape Town from Robben Island. Now, support for, for, for liberation in Southern Africa uh, 
grew gradually over the 60s and into the 1970s. By the 1980s, it emerged as a major force uh, in supporting liberation in Southern Africa in the United States and in Europe. Now, in the United States, it grows out of an interesting context. And this is really where uh, I'm going to focus the focus of the talk this evening. Um, it grows out of, you know, out of the out of the civil out of the civil rights movement in large part, but in particularly out of the part the part of the civil rights movement that engaged in Pan-African thought and support for Pan-African liberation. Uh, many of the people who wind up becoming very important in the anti-apartheid movement, both here in Houston and across the United States, are people who have deep, long connections to Africa. Of course, here in Houston, we were represented in Congress uh, during much of this time by one of the most prominent examples of this, the Congressman Mickey Leland, who was very much throughout his career as a congressman and before an advocate for, uh, for Africa, for African peoples, and in the Southern African context, for African liberation. Uh, as agitation began to increase in the 1980s, uh, both in, both in South Africa and, and in response outside South Africa, Leland is gonna play a critical role in mobilizing support across the nation for the concept of an anti-apartheid movement. In South Africa, uh, a, a new generation of leaders is emerging, uh, led most prominently by Steve Biko and other members of what was called the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa. Um, Protests in the, in the mid-1970s had turned violent in South Africa with the Salwedo uprising and the violent repression of that uprising. Uh, in the early 1980s, uh, the Congress of South African Trade Unions uh, and others, and others including church groups, uh, formed what was called the, the United Democratic Front that began to press an internal uh, drive to, to end apartheid. And in this context then, the, the outside of South Africa, organizing to support the Africa, African liberation in Southern Africa became a central component of activism uh, of, in the black community and as a way of building, uh, you know, alliances across communities in the United States. Houston became involved in this back in 1982. In 1982, Leland uh, arranged for the Congressional Black Caucus to hold a meeting here in Houston. And in the aftermath of that meeting, the Southern African Task Force was organized amongst its leaders were Benevia Nyamu, uh, an American who had connections to liberation movements in Southwest Africa or now Namibia, um, who in 1982 uh, helped organize this, th this organization focusing in the first instance on denying South African airways the right to land at Intercontinental Airport. This became the sort of first signature issue of the, uh, the anti-apartheid movement in Houston was denying the, uh, this, this connection here. They were successful eventually in getting South African airways denied the, the access to access to Intercontinental Air, Airport and moved on towards organizing regular demonstrations at what was then the South African consulate in the Galleria area. Uh, in fact, the sort of corner of, of Westheimer and Post Oak became a key site for regular demonstrations that drew hundreds of people's uh, protest against apartheid in South Africa. Nationally, by the mid 1980s, in, the anti-apartheid activism uh, began to focus on what was called the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in Congress. Ronald Reagan had assumed the presidency in, of course, 1981. Uh, part of his original policy thrust in international affairs was to de-emphasize uh, human rights, which had been a signature issue for the Carter administration, and to re-emphasize anti-communism. Uh, for many, many 
supporters, many members of Congress. Uh, the, the, the ANC was a prime example of a communist backed movement that sought to overthrow what they regarded as a friendly regime uh, in South Africa. Uh, in 1985, given the continuing repression uh, uh, that was occurring in South Africa, support for this position began to break in Congress. Uh, in order to keep the pressure on Congress, demonstrations began to increase across the country. Uh, and, and arrests were made as people sought to sit in at uh, consulates or at or the South African embassies in New York at, to the UN and in Washington to the United States. Uh, a National Day of Action was organized in uh, 1980, uh, 1985. Uh, this is a picture from a Mandela Day run in Houston that was organized by the Southern Africa Task Force in 1983. Um, and in November 1985, uh, Congressman Leland was arrested at the, at the embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, in Houston. Three prominent act activists uh, were arrested at the South African consulate. In, um, they, they included Omawali Lithuli, Judan Boney, and Al Edwards. So hopefully some of these names are familiar to you, and this is going to be one of the points that I'm going to that I'm going to conclude with is the way in which activism during the 1980s is a breeding ground for continued engagement uh, in progressive issues in, in the years afterwards. Both uh, Mr. Luthuli and Mr. Boney described their arrest to me in the same way. They both commented that you know unlike uh, Congressman Leland. Uh, who and many others across the country who were arrested in these protests and these obviously being symbolic events. Uh, these most people were taken to jail. As they, they, as um, Mr. Luthuli said, they were given coffee and donuts. They were given maybe a court appearance ticket for you know a, a misdemeanor charge, and then sent on their way so they could watch themselves on the news at night. As he described this, I this was. A, you know, it, it made me laugh because that was exactly what happened when I got arrested uh, in an anti-apartheid protest in Chicago uh, dur during this period. Um, here in Houston, though, uh, led by apparently uh, the then District Attorney Johnny Holmes, uh, the, a decision was made to take a hard line on this. And uh, both uh, Mr. Boney and Mr. Luthuli were jailed overnight. Al Edwards uh, was eventually bailed out. They were, uh, they came to trial, they were convicted and sentenced to 14 days in prison, uh, along with the five. Now, fortunately for them, uh, a judge went back and reduced their sentence, so neither spent more than uh, a day or two more in jail. But it, you know, it became something that of, of national note that Houston, that in Houston, uh, you know, they, this hard line had been taken against the protest that was supporting a movement that had widespread support all over the country. The um, Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act was not only passed in Congress, it was duly vetoed by President Reagan and a bipartisan uh, two thirds majority voted to override President Reagan's veto. Now, this wasn't the end of the anti-apartheid struggle, uh, this success. In fact, in many ways, this type of protest uh, continued with a further aim, and that aim was what was called divestment. The idea that, uh, that corporations in the United States and organizations such as colleges and universities, cities, should not invest in companies that were doing business in South Africa. Uh, Protest along this issue continued in Houston, uh, particularly at the University of Houston. And this is covered in a, a very good article by Brant Roberts uh, in the Houston Review of Books, an online magazine published just this May, which talks about the way that the Black Student Union and the Student Government Organization at, at the University of 
Houston, uh, continued to press the issue of divestment uh, throughout 1985 and 1986, organizing many uh, demonstrations on campus, and eventually were able to negotiate a divestment uh, a divestment uh, process with the Board of Regents of the University of Houston. For its part, the city of Houston, under Mayor Kathy Whitmire at that time, also divested its, uh, its pension funds from uh, corporations doing business in South Africa. The protest against apartheid even reached the building of infrastructure in Houston. The Fred Hartman Bridge, the long bridge over the ship channel uh, on uh, what is now, I guess, Texas 99, the Grand Parkway, was uh, commissioned in the 1980s. Uh, final design was approved in 1985. Uh, the, the, the original plan was that it would be constructed with steel brought from South Africa. Protest against this uh, developed and forced the, uh, highway, the State Highway Commission to eventually agree not to use South African steel uh, in the building of the bridge. Now, the irony of this is that the bridge was delayed for so long that by the time it was finished in 1995, apartheid had fallen and Nelson Mandela was the president of South Africa. So they went back to the original plan and ordered the steel from South Africa. These protests um, complemented the ongoing, uh, complemented and made the white South African government realize that it did not have uh, the type of international support that it had counted on uh, up until the 1980s. Starting in 1988, uh, the South African government offered to release Mandela from prison offered to negotiate with the ANC directly, with him at its head, uh, moved him out of Robben Island and into uh, uh, more comfortable accommodations at a different prison camp compound uh, in order to sort of promote this idea. Mandela initially refused to be released uh, without there being uh, substantial progress on a movement towards dismantling apartheid and creating a unified nation in South Africa. Finally, in February 1990, he was released from prison and began at the head of the ANC and of other anti-apartheid organizations at the time, uh, a, a long contentious process of negotiating an end to apartheid, one that was actually filled with violence uh, with elements of the old white government and white society uh, resisting, uh, arming uh, different, uh, not only arming themselves, but also arming uh, other factions within the black community to, uh, to try and, and de derail the movement towards it. But eventually an agreement was reached. And in 1994, uh, non-racial elections were held, the ANC, uh, the ANC won a, uh, an overwhelming majority of all the votes in South Africa, and South Africa became you know, a free country, something it remains today. In the middle of this process, Mandela went on a tour of the United States. Uh, he, the conclusion of his tour was a visit to Houston where Dominic de Manel of the Manel Museum and Institute uh, arranged for him to receive what was then called the, the Manil Carter Award uh, for our uh, prize for human rights. And the major universities in Houston, Texas Southern, the University of Houston and Rice came, came together to jointly award Mandela a degree, an honorary doctorate in December, 19, in December 1991. Uh, this is, I can't say that this is my picture, it's from the Houston Chronicle. I was there at the time I came to Houston in 1988 uh, as a faculty member at Texas Southern. But um, for many of us that, that saw this event, that um, 
that that were there. It served as a sort of a, a nice culmination of, of what had been a long struggle uh, in South Africa, particularly to a lesser extent in uh, in the rest of the world as it sought to support liberation in South Africa. Now, as I promised, one of the points that I wanted to make on this was talking about the way that this activism that you saw in Houston, that you saw across the United States, that you saw across the developed world, um, helped serve as a sort of a bridge between the activism in the United States of the civil rights era and, uh, and the development of a, a new generation of particularly black leadership uh, here in the United States. Not only did people like Mickey Leland, uh, Ernest McGowan on the city council, Rodney Ellis, Anthony Hall, all prominent figures here in Houston, uh, for, uh, support the anti-apartheid movement in different ways, but also people like Judon Boney, who later would, be, would serve for, for a number of years with distinction on the city council, and Ada Edwards, also a, a former city council person here in Houston. Uh, this became part of the way that they translated their activism into concrete actions to support progressive causes and ideas in Houston. It I think reminds us that no struggle in, in, in reality ends simply or uh, swiftly. That there always remains, there always remain issues that must continue to be addressed in order to make society, society a better society. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions. Well, I'm just waiting to see um, if there are any questions. I don't see any. Please type them in your um, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Okay, it looks like we've got one going now. Um, so I've got a question from, did you ever meet Nat Levy? No, I did not ever have the opportunity to meet him. <clears throat> Mr. Levy, of course, uh, lived here in Houston for many years, but he was one of the lawyers for Nelson Mandela at the Ravonia trial. And it was, you know, I had, I heard, um, I heard uh, over the years, a number of times about him, but I never had the opportunity to meet him. Yeah, I, I, he was from Johannesburg, so um, I didn't ever know him either. Unfortunately, I never really got to meet him, but I know he and his wife were very well known here in Houston. So, um, let's see. So, let me... I, I had somebody... I had somebody else here that said, not being a native Houstonian, I wondered what the Fred Hartman Bridge was. And so they just thanked you for that. Did you want to ask us, answer something? Well, um, let me answer um, Mr. Fountain's question. There was an active opposition. Um, it, it, it tended to run along several lines. During the 1980s, um, Particularly, particularly re Republican-oriented, um, what we might think of as foreign policy hawks, were extremely critical of the the idea of, of supporting liberation in Southern Africa. And they saw it very much as, uh, you know, giving in to communism, and that was very much the way that that got phrased. Here in Houston, you also had an element of the business community, which it's which. You, you know, we tended to see the potential for uh, for trade and investment in Southern Africa. So, for example, Shell Oil 
uh, which of course has a large presence, has always had a large presence here in Houston, was very much uh, opposed to the idea of divestment and um, and quite actively tried to try to undermine it. There was also even at places like the University of Houston, you know, a sort of an active student group that opposed uh, divestment, that opposed, uh, you know, the idea of supporting, again, what was uh, commonly called a, um, you know, a communist movement, a communist front. Now, there were, um, it was a question with the Jewish community involved in the protest. There were certainly uh, the people who were Jewish who were involved in the protest, and they, um, you know, they, and and the protest uh, or the movement broadly, uh, you know, was one of the types of movements that, by its very nature, in many ways, uh, promoted the idea of collaboration of, of support across different communities. So, you, you know, there were there were quite a number that were quite active in. So there was, uh, did you see this question here? Please comment, please comment on the peace m movement throughout the US today addressing uh, black inequality. I'm sorry, Tamar, could you repeat that? Please comment on the present movement throughout the US today addressing black inequality. Okay, well, this is, this is what I'm, this is what I was trying to get at when I was talking about the continuity in, in activist ideas, in, in ideas of moving, for, moving society forward. I think you can draw a straight line in some respects uh, from the ideas that motivated uh, the people who were involved in the anti-apartheid movement to uh, whether we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement specifically or um, or we're talking about you know sort of a broader struggle to create a more just and equal society, um, as in South Africa, uh, you know the the movements the movement sometimes within itself debates over whether it's whether it's better to be a more inclusive movement or one that is a part of uh, the, the particular community that is subject to the oppression and they're in the, the history of anti-apartheid politics in South Africa, you, uh, this issue is a very, is a very important one, uh, often leading to uh, deep political co conflict, but one in which um, the end, as Mandela himself was, was, was wont to often uh, emphasize, was always the same, which is that it was promoting the, the liberation of Blacks in South Africa, and I think when we look at you know, struggles over, uh, over black inequality in, in the United States, we can see some of that same both tension within the movement and at the same time, uh, the way in which a, it tend, the way in which uh, the emphasis on what the eventual outcome is tends to, tends to, to allow the movement to move forward. Um, we have another question here. Why did the movement have communist undertones? Was it being sponsored by communist countries? Um, okay, tomorrow I'm actually looking at uh, the questions myself. You're, you're oh, okay. The, let me, like I said, and I, and I tried to answer it, I think there is a great deal of continuity uh, in, the, in the ideas that drove the anti-apartheid movement and the ideas that, that drive the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, you know, I think you can see this in the emphasis on uh, on promoting not just equality but equity, and I think that's a um, and and I think that's a that's a real important common theme in these things. Um, 
I, I see that my friend, my colleague, Jesse Esparza from TSU has asked a question. Um, the, the, like I said, there was opposition to the, he asked if there was a backlash uh, to the, I guess he means the anti-apartheid movement uh, in Houston and, and so where did it come from? And like I said, it, there was, and it, it drew on it drew on these two main strands, and one was, if you will, you know, the anti-communism, and the other was the emphasis on sort of on on economics, on um, on on economics, and that's tended to be where most of the the of the public opposition uh, to the to the anti-apartheid movement came from. And then I'm asked, of course, a, a very hard question, which is, what do, you, what do you think of those who claim that Israel is an apartheid state, uh, an apartheid country? Well, it's, I mean, let me put it to you like this. My, Israel is a liberal democracy. It has an open society. Uh, it has it, it it contests these issues itself. I think that we can we can know this and we can still, you know, have a critical uh, vantage point on on many of the things that Israel does in, in terms of how it treats the Pal how it has treated and treats Palestinians. I think in the long run. You know, it will be up to up to Israelis and Palestinians to solve the to solve this issue, and that all, and that as outsiders, what we can do is support solutions that that both uh, recognize the historic importance of Israel and at the same time recognize the legitimate national demands of Palestinians. Do we have any more questions? I think we've got to all of them, right? Yeah, it looks to me like we have. Well, thank you very much for um, for listening to me. I hope you found this uh, this interesting. I certainly had a great deal of uh, brought back some memories in doing some of this research um, and it, it, it gave me some hope. Well, thank you very much for a very outstanding presentation and showing us how the anti-apartheid movement helped bring change in South Africa. So um, I'll close this out then and thank you everyone for joining us on this webcast this evening and good night. Thanks very much.